we are at noon, so I'm going to go ahead and get us uh, get us started. Adam, thank you for putting that up, um, and I, I want to welcome everyone. Oh, go can ahead. Can I just Elsa. mention really quick that this meeting is being recorded for internal purposes? Um, and Vanessa, go ahead. Yes, and you know what? I will mention that at the end of my introduction, just in case we have people joining late. Um, so thank you for that, Allison. And welcome, everyone. Um, this is the NESDIS User Engagement Community Speaker Series. We call this Meet Your User. And today we have Jessica Block from Wi-Fi. Uh, Jessica Block, if you can go to the next slide, Adam. Jessica Block is the Associate Director for Wi-Fi Labs out of UC San Diego. Um, Jessica really works to minimize disasters and disaster risk using emerging technologies. And with her work at Wi-Fi, they work very closely with CAL FIRE and California first responders to wildfire to really support decisions and operations. Um, they are currently supporting CAL OES, the FIRES program, which is an emerging um, fires uh, response program for the state of California. Previous to Wi-Fi, uh, Ms. Block was in wildfire safety. She was at the advisory board at the state of California. And she is a degree graduate from UCLA and ASU, Arizona State University, focusing on sustainability and urban ecology. Um, we are going to hear from Jessica. She's going to run us through Wi-Fi and the elements of Wi-Fi. She's going to tell us a little bit about what they do and how they use NOAA data. So I encourage you to either please use the chat function to bring your questions uh, over to Jessica. We will help facilitate that process. Um, or you can uh, speak and uh, voice your question on your own. We will make this a dynamic discussion. Uh, Jessica, I'm going to hand it over to you. I want to thank you for being part of the speaker series. This is the second, um, second presentation in this series. So I'm um, very excited to have you. Uh, you've done a lot of work with, uh, with some of our missions so far, and the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. I don't have COVID, supposedly, but I've had a sore throat for over a week and I lost my voice yesterday. So I hope I come through and it doesn't it doesn't go go out on me in this time. Uh, let me see. Let's share my screen. And so um, Allison, if you're checking the chat, if it if there's any connectivity issues, try to um, just let me know. Sure. All right. So thank you, Vanessa, for that introduction. My name is Jessica Block. I'm the Associate Director for Operational Programs at Wi-Fi Lab. Um, we've been growing since 2013, founded by Elkai Altintosh. She's the data science officer, uh, chief data science officer at, at the supercomputer at UCSD. And uh, not too long ago, just a couple of years ago, we've added Rodman Lynn and Kevin Hires um, to our lab. The names here are just some of our leadership. Ke Rodman Lynn runs, um, is at Los Alamos National Labs. Um, and he does uh, very high resolution wildfire modeling. And Kevin Hires is at the Forest Service currently. Um, Melissa Floca is our director of um, strategic partnerships. I do operational programs, and Dan Crawl is our developer. And the reason why I'm going through these names and talking about them at the start is that is to to show that um, well, and Kevin Hires is a forester and firefighter also um, in his past life. We come from we're, we're data scientists, we're fire modelers. Um, and for me, I'm bringing um, this combination of technical and practical people into the um, wildfire response space. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're, what we're embarking on in our research, but also um, our operational space. We're an unusual, an unusual group in that we um, are enabling the research, doing some of the research, and then also deploying the research in operations. So just to set the stage, um, I'm a little bit blind to those that are, that, well, I, I literally can't see the audience right now because I'm sharing my screen, but I also, I'm not sure who the audience is in terms of what you know about wildfire. Um, so I'll start with this, that in 2020, we had 10 million acres burn in California um, and $16 billion in property damage. Um, the fire response itself cost $3.4 billion. And these are, for the most part, estimates. Um, 2020 really blinded us. We had a, a large uh, dry lightning storm that was really unprecedented. And there were just so many fires happening all at the same time. 
um, that resources were really strapped, not to mention um, with COVID and COVID regulation, um, a lot of the fire departments throughout the state of California and I'm sure nationally are, are understaffed. Um, so what we saw in 2020, we saw elements of, again, in 2021, we had very large wildfires. Um, some started by utility company, others that started after large mega fires had begun earlier in the season that didn't have enough staff to respond to. California's at a turning point. Um, our, what our forestry practices have caught up to us and, uh, and our, the state of things in, with, uh, with our climate have really strapped our resources and our ability to fight fires as we've done. So the key to what Y Fire Lab is trying to aim at over the, since the last few years is to enable a much more proactive prescribed fire. We know that what, that fire is an inevitable inevitable part of nature, but mega fires do not need to be. Um, we are quite limited. Uh, well, since since uh, for the last 100 plus years, we've been suppressing wildfire on our landscape, and that has led to a very dense and quite unhealthy uh, forest ecosystem throughout North America. Um, so fire needs to be reintroduced, and there's a lot of challenges that, um, that come with that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, meanwhile, wildfire as a research field, and it, especially wildfire fighting, is, a, is largely a very tech-poor environment. They've been doing things quite low-tech. Um, but there's so much data that needs to be integrated it needs to be done in a much more real-time fashion for um, effective firefighting and integration of that data um, to be usable while firefighting. Um, but there's so little that's made it like very readily accessible. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about these pieces of data and how they fit into our process and operations as well. Um, so, <coughs> pardon me fire behavior modeling in the operational space has to, has traditionally been used um, as large incident management teams have been deployed, deploying a fire behavior analyst um, that's using strategic daily models for, for strategic daily operations. And what we've been able to do in Wi-Fire partnered with the California Office of um, Emergency Services and Southern California Fire Department is to deploy operational fire models on the initial attack of a fire so that when firefighters are deploying to investigate that fire, they know where it is and they know that fire's potential and where it could go at that, at that time, enabling faster strategic response. Um, there are multiple, so now I'm going to get a little bit more in the weeds. Um, there are many places where wildland fire models can enter into, fire, into the fire management space. And what I just described has to do with the response component to wildfires in California on initial attack, as in when a 911 call comes in, and somebody's reporting a, a smoke plume, which could be uh, a homeless encampment or somebody's barbecue that just is emitting a little bit of smoke. We deploy the Farsight, um, the Farsight Fire Simulator to run these models, um, and that came out of the M Missoula Forest Service Lab um, many years ago, but it runs at a very, very operational speed, so it's easy to, to run on initial attack. There's also um, many places where wildfire modeling can be applied. Um, for instance, let's see, can, I hope, let me know if you cannot see my pointer, how's that? Um, a resource benefit decision for running prescribed fires or- um, yeah, we don't see your pointer, just so you- You do not, okay, well, upper, thank you. Upper right um, or right side is um, strategic prescribed fire, um, 
application, um, getting much more tactical about how you're going to apply fire to the landscape to actually receive particular types of benefits. So, you know, making sure that when you run prescribed fire, you also are doing it in a way that's giving you the outcome that you want. Do you want to torch the crowns of some of your of your trees and kill them? Do you want to just get clear out the understory? Um, do you want to make sure that you're protecting certain endangered species? Um, are there very specific weather conditions that you must uh, only burn on to achieve your, your desired result? Um, and so in order to get that specific and that strategic with prescribed fire, um, we need to do the integration of all the data that's out there that can be applied to, one, the situational awareness of the environment, and then also the data that must go into these predictive models. So we, in California, because we've been addressing this problem, these mega fires since 2003, quite frankly, there was a fire called the Cedar Fire, which was for many years the largest fire in California, um, was in San Diego County. Um, and then we had large fires in San Diego again in 2007 in, uh, that were caused by the utility company. Utility companies have been installing um, weather stations and um, pan tilt zoom cameras throughout the state of California, which means that when we want to run a, a fire behavior model at any point within the state, we actually know what the weather is quite well at that location. We can look at the camera and see if the smoke plume is bent down, and we can input the weather, you know, the wind, speed and direction, and the temperature and humidity from these weather stations throughout. We get very high resolution weather, which is critical to um, a dependable model. But there's also a lot of data that's being generated from many corners of research, um, including uh, weather forecasts, um, some being generated by utilities that have their own, their, their own higher resolved uh, weather forecast data um, that they're sharing with us, which I'll share, and then vegetation and landscape data, um, and then near real time and maybe recent remote sensing data from various platforms, including the satellites um, provide, provided by NOAA, VIRS, GOES, um, MODIS, etc. cetera. Um, so these data sets come from various local, state, and federal organizations, but they're not all, they're not together in one accessible place. Um, and they're also not necessary. Some of them are not even available for download. For instance, the weather, the utility companies are now developing their own weather, their weather forecasts. Um, but it's not necessarily in their mandate to to serve them in in a way that is easily downloadable for research for researchers or to be entered into operational uh, fire forecasts. So what we're doing at the Wi Fire Lab is building this continuum of computing and data technologies needed for data to be made accessible and then deployable within different uh, fire and machine learning models um, that go through the process of preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery. So I need to check my time. Okay, so <clears throat> There are these components of the Wi-Fi lab at a, uh, at a glance that I've described to some piece. What I oversee mostly in my operational role is using the fire map interface. Um, and we use that uh, for the initial attack response process um, under the Cal OES virus program. Um, on the far right uh, is the Burn Pro 3D interface that is going to, that we're developing actively through National Science Foundation funding that is going to be designed to run ensembles of higher resolution fire behavior models under various conditions so that you can optimize your prescribed fires. Um, and this should become much more relevant because we need to scale up our prescribed fire nationally um, on our landscape. 
to get ahead of the deficit that we've had over the last 100 years. And then in the middle here is Wi-Fi or Edge, and we're actually still, we're just in the very beginning stages of this process, which is deploying Edge compute devices um, on fire trucks and different sensing capabilities on firefighters, that, um, which is funded by uh, Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate, um, so that so that data collected within in the field can be parsed um, at the edge, so that we do not have to clog bandwidth for you know optimizing data that goes back to operations. The way that we're doing all of this is through what we're calling uh, the Wi-Fi or Commons. There is a data model, a data and model commons component, an AI gateway, um, and then a fire science workflows component that then um, enables the solutions element. Um, if I, <clears throat> here is a snapshot of what the commons looks like if you were to go to it. If you go to this link here, wifire.ucsd.edu slash commons, you'll see that there's opportunities to go to either the data commons or the model explorer. So if you want to find out what uh, data is available from NOAA, for instance, or from uh, maybe San Diego Gas and Electric, who's giving us their weather forecasts, you can search keywords and see the data that's made available. And then um, within the AI gateway, you could deploy some of these fire models and choose the data that is um, curated properly to be inputted into specific models. So the idea here is to is for the Wi-Fi lab or the Wi-Fi commons interface to be a gateway to um, any data that that exists. So we would federate it. wouldn't wouldn't necessarily host it all, but this would be the place where data that's available um, from NOAA that it may or may not be e more very easily um, findable um, or knowable can be point pointed to this interface and then we can also make sure to curate it in such a way that the format is appropriate for inputting those data to um, different types of models. And then the goal here too is also to make sure that data and uh, that data and models are in an open framework. That's not to say that all data that we federate is completely open. Um, some data may have some security sensitivity and so then they're, they're behind uh, credentialing um, interfaces so that they're not completely open. But what's really important to note is, is the transparency in the components of the data and the components of the models. And that's important to want to advance the science. And fire behavior science is a quite small field. There are very few of those experts. Um, and there are many different ways it can be done. And then the data sets themselves being particularly increasingly high resolution, which I'll show you, um, uh, are harder to host and harder to create and harder to host. Um, and so we're, we're working to enable that as well. Um, let's skip some of these. Yes, these are some of these slides are my, my bosses. Um, and so um, so here is the, um, here's what we are doing here with uh, the operational space is using the fire map. Um, in this virus program. So what you'll see here on the left is uh, a snapshot of a fire that um, this is our fire map interface and actually we um, have subscriptions from local fire departments in, in Southern California currently that are using it for operations when, a, when they hear that a fire has begun and or they validated that there's one that that exists they'll run a predictive model and you'll see I don't know if it's if you can see here easily the, um, the boxes that are in that image are showing the weather at that location, 
uh, a thumbnail for what the mountaintop cameras can see at that location, and then a summary of what the predictive model shows, including its acreage at every 30-minute time step and the population and housing uh, that could be uh, consumed at each of those phases in total. And they'll run those models um, on the back of a truck when they're uh, when they've arrived, or have so they a couple of years ago used to do it just on their phones um, while they were en route. And in in doing this, um, the way that we staff the program, uh, the models are delivered to uh to an interface currently we're using whatsapp as the common interface for to uh, for transmitting these models out to uh, subscribing firefighters and we communicate with aircraft that is staged and funded by the state of california made available specifically for um, assessing these emerging incidents and this is a new process that i cannot emphasize how effective is especially for the American West where these fires can start and then become monstrous very very early. Typically when a fire begins there is aircraft that may go to either drop water or fire retardant um, but there is not as protocol aircraft that is available for data collection in real time to assess the emerging fire um, and so when we deploy, when we do this assessment in real time, we run these models and in deploying the model, the aircraft is also, the aircraft um, air tactical group supervisor, who is also a firefighter, assesses the situation and determines whether or not to launch the aircraft. And then within 20 minutes to an hour, we're getting live real time updated data on that wildfire which we can then use to refine the fire model and, um, and size up the potential for the need for evacuation. Um, and so this is operationalizing wildfire in a completely different space. Um, and it's also, uh, and now we also are collecting real-time accurate data of wildfires as they're growing, which we didn't used to have either. From a research standpoint, this is very useful because um, we haven't had accurate perimeters of small wildfires to help validate the fire behavior models in the first place. So when we think about operation, operationalizing um, fire behavior models, we also need to make sure we have the appropriate validation data to improve these models, and this program is also doing that. Um, I've already spoken about this, that this sort of fair, uh, fair data practices, which means uh, free and accessible um, and reproducible data. Um, so the data governance um, is an important key piece of what the Wi-Fi lab is aiming to to enable through the commons and through you know as we are also supporting these operational um, systems feeding that data back into the Wi-Fi commons and um, enabling that transparency um, so I would like to may I stop my share for a moment I'm going to scroll through. Yeah, we have all control, Jessica. So, and I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, I'd like to share just a couple more slides. And I know I have the whole hour, but I might not make it that long. It's okay. Um, I Once you're ready, I'll open it up. To, uh, to some questions regarding your participation as a Pathfinder, your recent tabletop, and see if there are um, others that have, you know, recommendations or, or questions as well, given what you've talked about so far. Okay, that's, that sounds great. Um, so here, I'd like to just demo some examples of the data of, for these platforms that I've just described. Um, so, uh, 
The fuel data that we use for Farsight in our operational programs are come from Land Fire, um, which I will assume most of you know about. It's um, it's been sort of the the best fuel data available, um, and it's a 30 meter resolution product, um, 30 meters per pixel, based from Landsat, but also integrating a number of other data sets. And, um, and we use it in the FIRES program when we run our Farsight models. Um, when it gets down, one 30 meter resolution couldn't, can't, can't resolve what's actually on the ground. Um, although the fuel models do characterize um, combinations of fuels. <laughs> the, um, uh, when we talk about doing this prescribed fire work, we're using quick fire, which was developed by Rod Lynn, um, <clears throat> and is a three-dimensional coupled fire model. And, um, and I'll run an animation here that um, describes how the fire would run through the landscape here. And in this model, it's not just running across the landscape, it's also um, traveling through the crown, and um, it's an actual 3D atmospheric um, coupled model as well. And so um, if you look at the, at the snapshot of the fuel data that is inputted to this model here, fast fuels um, generated by the USGS is the data product. product. It's a sort of voxelized, also modeled 3D product. Um, that uh, can give you a sense of what is grass, what is shrub, and the density of, of conifer trees throughout your landscape. Um, and so getting at this high resolution, we're now serving uh, the, at least the continue, the lower 48 states worth of this data um, in the Wi-Fi commons that can then now be used to run quick fire models. Um, Back to the FIRES program, wanted to um, share some of the some examples of data that have come that uh, highlight how we how we're running that program. Um, so Wi-Fire sits within what we call a fusion center, supervised by firefighters. Um, so those of us at Wi-Fire who are running the models. Um, are coordinating with firefighters who are listening to radio and sizing up uh, an emerging fire while we're also assessing the location and the inputs that need to go into the model. And when we run them and we push them out to the field, um, it'll go to back to dispatch centers of, of interest um, and also will go to you know, the, the incident commander in the field and also to these other, com maybe you could call them common operating pictures or these um, mobile deployable platforms. ATAC in particular is one that we're, that we've partnered with um, that has, uh, that's, it's specifically uh, designed for use in the field, knowing where people, you know, using people's GPS locations to know where trucks are and people are, and um, integrating the models and the perimeters from FIRES is a somewhat new and exciting component of the ATAC platform. Um, <clears throat> this is what our fusion center managers' tape, uh, desktops look like, basically looking for where the firefighters are, oh, you can't see my pointer, where the firefighters are in the upper left. Um, what the what the mountaintop cameras are showing us on the right, um, and then being able to run the models and communicate with uh, firefighters. Um, so this is our sort of our our dispatch center in our living rooms. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to transition a little bit now to um, our tabletop exercise. So. Um, speaking of the virus program and responding to emerging incidents, um, we do that through a number of alerting, alerting mechanisms. Um, 911 calls is one. 
we uh, subscribe. We have a feed from the Irwin database, which is uh, basically an aggregate or cloud version of the, of the computer aided dispatch systems throughout California. <coughs> Pardon me. And we use all of and we use satellite fire detections as a key component to understanding where fires are emerging and growing. This is an, a screenshot of the Blue Ridge incident, which was in October of 2020. The 911 call we received was the red pin in the sort of middle left. It was clearly somebody, what, what I can assess from this image is that that was somebody on the highway driving past that fire and calling 911 from their cell phones. So by the time that that person had completed its call, they were no longer specifically at the location of that wildfire. So I, I saw that, I went to my map and looked to see where this fire might be. Um, I saw that, um, and then this ghost detection showed up, which is the red, the large red pixel. And I thought, and so I assessed that potentially the fire is actually to the east and this person has driven past it. And then a firefighter I was working with from the city of Corona uh, arrived on scene and gave me the lat long of that yellow dot that's within the ghost pixel. So I knew exactly where there to drop my pin and run a model. Um, so these fire detections, these satellite fire detections are extremely useful when it's for understanding emerging fires. Cur um, so uh, here is another example um, from the past, but I like I like using it because we have um, some good screenshots of how the data is integrated here. Um, you can see the those hotspots um, in the image on the left. And you can see that the fields of views of the, of the mountaintop cameras that in this case were um, installed by Southern California Edison that had really tight views on the smoke plume. And one of the screenshots of those cameras are on the upper right there. And you can see not only the smoke plume, you can get a sense that the smoke is coming from the you know, the, the rear of that image, but the plume is also completely bent down, meaning that there's really intense wind on it. So we know that it's a fire that's running fast. And then um, in the image on the left, you can, within the GOES hotspot detections is the perimeter that the aircraft collected for us. We use that perimeter to run to run a continuous model here, and this was an actually a particularly successful um, exercise because we ran this model that you see in the lower right. Um, I hope you can see how the model shows the fire running to the southwest as the wind is pushing it that way, and it hits Highway 14 and then jumps Highway 14 and runs these spots that come to the south. Uh, the battalion chief that was uh, responding to this fire wasn't sure. He thought that was a pretty ambitious model. He didn't. He wasn't sure that that would actually happen, but he sent the National Guard to go to that location in the off chance that the embers did fly over the highway, uh, which it did end up doing, and the guard was there and ready to put out those fires as they were um, emerging from the embers that had had floated across. So. You know, this was a this was a rapidly moving, <clears throat> quickly scaling fire, and the model helped inform much more rapid and strategic decisions that I think um, showed it certainly saved uh, money, if not structures and and lives. <clears throat> Here's an example of some challenges that we're starting to see um, from uh, from the satellite data, um, we often, um, so depending on whether it goes 16 or 17, our, our locations, the location of the hotspot detections can actually be off. Um, and we're embarking with NOAA now to help 
to deploy new algorithms, including terrain, adding terrain correction for uh, improved location accuracy and importing these new, these new revised products into our operational process um, in the state of California. Um, and speaking of the tabletop, um, we had a tremendously successful experience. Uh, we hosted, um, thanks to Vanessa Escobar, in April of 2022. Um, and we used the example of the Bobcat fire. Um, the, on the right is the uh, Cal Guard perimeters um, showing the life of that, of the Bobcat fire. And on the left is one of my initial wildfire models for uh, at the, that was at the very early stages of that wildfire. Um, this was a really interesting tabletop, which um, Vanessa, I might ask you to um, to discuss with me in terms of the outcomes that you guys have um, written up. Um, but this this was a very um, a useful discussion in one talking about using satellite data integrated um, for fire response. This was on federal land, um, but very uh, significantly impacted the urban area around it. So the Los Angeles metro area, and then actually over time into the desert cities. Um, there were massive fires that were already burning, uh, one immediately to the east um, that had been running at least a couple of weeks by the time this fire had begun. Um, and, uh, and there were times during the life of this fire that getting a, a thermal night flight uh, to assess the growth of the perimeter was not even available because there were so many other wildfires in California burning. So the firefighters actually leaned on the satellite fight hotspot detections to to estimate the growth of that fire over um, over each day. Um, and so uh, yeah, uh, let's see. I think and so here I think I might end here. Um, this is a slide that Vanessa put together actually showing uh, this, the, the data that we used for our tabletop. Um, on the upper right is the GOES 17 data product uh, that was generated during the life of the Bob, well, uh, during a, a particular day in the, during the Bobcat fire where the weather, um, the fire weather was much more severe than was expected and the fire blew out into two different directions. Um, on the lower right is the synthetic data product that simulates what the future uh, satellites might, might deliver um, in terms of a fire radiative power um, and would be a much higher resolution. So instead of two kilometers per pixel, it would be a one kilometer per pixel, which would help resolve the emergence of uh, new hotspots uh, or embers and the growth of that fire. And um, when these things, when fires like this change so rapidly, actually being able to track the growth through satellite fire detections is uh, a tremendous asset for firefighters. And they were they were using that um, to the best of their ability at the time. Um, so I've been I've spoken about many corners of the Wi Fire. Uh, lab objectives and programs. I think I'll stop there and, and start to take some questions. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah, Jessica, that sounds really great. I did want to add something before we transition to questions in case there, um, I don't see anybody from GeoXO um, in, in attendance, but in case somebody does have questions, this was uh, in collaboration as uh, Wi-Fi's role as a NOAA Pathfinder they are a Pathfinder supporting the GeoXO mission, working with the science team that developed that um, GeoXO ABI example. I did write a little bit about that in the chat. I do see Shoba online, um, but if there's any additional questions to that, we can go ahead and take those, or I can send them over to to GeoXO. Just so, just to highlight that piece. Okay, that sounds good. Should yeah. I should I stop sharing my screen?
Yes. Um, you know, why don't we leave it up just in case people want you to go back to a, a different slide. We'll open it up for sure. questions. I did see some hands go up. Um, and then we'll chat already. Go ahead. How far off are the wildfire detections spatially? Are they in feet, miles, and are there temporal differences? Um, so I think the GO-16 product, which is, I th uh, they, so sometimes in some of the examples I've shown can be spot on, and then in other cases I've seen it be as much as, like, It can be like, I think, a half a mile off. It can be significant. And some of that has to do with, I think, understanding temperature differences and what the detection is, um, is measuring. So I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't think I understand it well enough to describe. Um, no, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, Dave Holmes has a question. Yeah, I think on the uh, mapping issue, I think what's going on there system systemically is parallax correction. As you know, the goes <clears throat> goes 16 goes east, you know, is over pretty far away, pretty far east from California and go 17 is you know a little bit to the to the west at 10, 105 i think so you know as you as you go off you know the the equator and start looking towards california that parallax from begins to grow and if you don't account for it in your mapping adequately uh you're going to have a an error between what's observed and what what's derived from the goes uh data so I think Nestus is working on the parallax mapping. Uh, and so I, I think that's the issue that's been pretty well documented. So this is my two cents on the, yeah. the discussion. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Yeah, and it, you know, it makes sense, right, not to use a satellite that's so far away, um, that's um, more to the east of the, of the country. And as you know, GO-17 had its thermal issues. Now GO-18 is up and on, on station, and it's going to be checked out real soon. So good news for California, uh, because that will be in the GOES-West slot. Uh, and, and your primary probably data source for what you're doing, Jessica. Great. Thank you. Yep. Um, I do want to say that um, uh, the future satellites that will be um, – that will be one kilometer resolution instead of two will be also hugely helpful because basically when you have a pixel that's doing heat detection, you need to have enough of that pixel that is hot to be act to actually detect the difference. And I'll say that a lot of the small wildfires that we see don't ever um, give us goes alerts um, the of the current the current um, Go 17 um, detections because a two kilometer uh, to have a significant portion of a two kilometer pixel um, be hot enough for it to t detect. You know, 99 percent of the fires that we do s see in California get get knocked down before they be become large. So because we have so many people in California, we often get enough uh, alerting. Um, through 911 to respond to these fires before they get big enough to be a detection. When we get down to the one kilometer pixel, I think that's actually going to change the game pretty significantly. Um, you know, if we get detections for for fire automatically from a higher resolution satellite, we're just going to be so much more informed um, and be able to triage incidents so much faster. So I'm really looking, I mean, I know we're some years away from that, but really looking forward to future products to, um, to uh, inform the initial attack process. Um, Rod, you have a question, go ahead. Thank you, I, um, um, I think this is really extremely helpful and impacting economically and uh, structure-wise and human life. But 
you mentioned earlier, which I agree with, there, there are a number of challenges that make this far more useful. Um, I would like your thoughts that um, this kind of utility maybe should be segmented into three different phases. One is the, is the predictive modeling, whereby um, you can isolate areas where there is very high likelihood of fire versus um, real-time monitoring of the fire. And half mile, I mean, the, for the first one, half mile, the one that you mentioned yeah. is acceptable, but for, for real-time monitoring, half half mile render that would be useless to to uh, give direction to the firefighting. And the third phase is the damage assessment. Is to um, uh, uh, and that's just just my thought, and you can give my uh, reaction. But another question is, how much of use have you made? And instead of just incorporating a um, citizen input by calling and telling you where the fire is moving and using the geosensors where they spread in most likely um, susceptible areas and also drones that can give you real time, very high resolution. Have you thought about incorporating those? And then I'm going to go on mute. Thank you. Yes. So. Um I want to make sure I cover all the points. So we've got detection, growth, and what was the third point? The uh, uh, damage. I mean, the three. Oh, and damage. Predictive, yeah, predictive modeling, then real real time monitoring, and then that after the fact damage assessment. Yes. So we um, are. Actually, we're, so we support all three phases, actually, for the Office of Emergency Services in California. So the predictive modeling, I'll tell you, you know, we, um, we will use the satellite detection in addition to, and we lean heavily on these um, monitoring cameras that are mostly built, most of them are built by the uh, Alert Wildfire System, which is also uh, a university supported program. Um, and so with the examples I've shown, you'll see that the satellite detection is a piece of the puzzle, but in order to be very highly resolved, we do use uh, cameras and the 911 call locations um, and potentially radio traffic for location to get a very precise ignition location. Um, for monitoring growth, We'll use the aircraft that we have as part of the fires program. Um, basically, when a fire begins, a temporary flight restriction airspace is implemented so that uh, the fire fighting aircraft can get on it. But the aircraft that we use has uh, some pretty good image sensing and can fly over the flight restriction space. So 10,000 feet and above, and we'll still get a very, uh, a really precise perimeter that they then send to uh, Intera, which is the program's uh, common operating picture. And from there, firefighters can either see it from that interface or download it and integrate it to other platforms. And we have a number of times kept the aircraft over an incident and they've generated pre uh, revised pre uh, polygons of the growing fire. Um, over short periods of time to monitor the growth. So there is value in using satellite data to do that to, to monitor growth, but I agree the the hotter a fire gets, the more that these satellites over per, will will give you heat that's radiating into the other pixels or detecting hot smoke or other other artifacts. Um, but it still does doesn't mean that they're not useful. From the damage assessment side, um, you know, imagery is key, and we'll we'll collect imagery from uh, custom aircraft, you know, as well. Um, and we can do that. We're actually developing a process right now for the state where we can uh, collect imagery from aircraft that might be in the mid wave infrared and uh, develop a machine learning process for estimating structures damaged within that first 24 to 48 hour period, which is a tough time to 
it's a necessary time to uh, understand whether or not a state of emergency needs to be declared. Um, and it's a tough time to actually know how many structures are damaged or destroyed. Um, when it, to speaking, speaking to your drone um, question, we're working with the California National Guard um, because they support CAL FIRE in these large incidents using their MQ-9s and other assets. Um, and those assets are military assets designed for uh, tracking targets. So they can be very useful for tracking the fire line in a high resolution and making sure that the fire line is contained. Um, but when you're tracking wildfires in great in large areas, actually taking imagery of, of a wide area at a time is much more useful. So uh, I think drones are useful and will, will be much more useful as uh, applications are developed. At the moment, I'm, our group is working on developing some techniques for damage assessment within the first 24 to 48 hours of an incident um, that currently have been sort of a struggle for uh, these, you know, these large incidents that happen, that blast through um, as people are scrambling. And we're developing an analytical process for doing that. Um, am I answering your questions? I can't, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's great. I just, I want to move on to the next question. Um, Absolutely. But I would also love to continue that conversation if oh, you reach yeah. out to me. Yeah, definitely. We, we'll make sure that everybody has your contact information. Um, you like, um, you know, within NOAA. And so the next question comes from Brian. Um, can you describe any interactions you or your team have with the NOAA National Weather Service fire incident meteorologists who are either at a field office or sometimes deployed to the scenes of fires in progress? Um, are there, are these interactions, if any, are, are they productive or would you suggest any changes to how they could evolve yeah um, we were we've been working with uh, Alex Tardy who's in the Rancho Bernardo office here in San Diego and he and his team have been tremendously proactive um, especially since COVID we get um, daily weather forecasts uh, size up for the Southern California region um, and they had also, um, in the 2019, 2020 time frame, deployed a, um, a pilot program for sending out text message alerts when there are GOES hotspot detections and they will receive them, validate them as real fires and push them out. And we use those uh, as, as part of our integrated process for responding to wildfires. Um, so, and he does, a, an amazing job at um, also sending out um, weather briefings so if there's some you know weather anomaly that's going that's approaching he'll give a, a webinar about it and uh, we'll get a good sense of you know when the what time of day the winds are going to pick up how, how long the duration for the event is going to be um, so I feel like we are we are consumers of the weather service uh, through his office um, of the weather service data through his office um, via the those hotspot detection alerts that are validated as well as these uh, informed weather event processes and I feel like we're pretty well integrated. When it comes to the um, incident meteorologists in these large incidents, the program that we support currently, I mean we will we will support some of these large incidents as they after they have become large incidents, but the majority of the work that we do in the Wi-Fi lab is this initial attack modeling process and um, tends to uh, be much more involved in that, like that first day or first day or two process. And so it's not usual that I will actually deploy to an incident and be coordinating with the incident meteorologists. Um, 
so I can't speak to that as much. Thank you. Um, Steve Marley, did you have a question still? Yeah, thanks, Alison. I, I, I just want to sort of tie, tidy up a little some of the questions which are in the chat, but also a following up on what you were talking about resolution and things. But for, 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 the, for the ignition events, um, has, are you aware of any studies that have been done that sort of tackle the um, uh, instrument resolution and 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 frequency and refresh and latency and those sorts of things. I'm thinking about things that might have been done at uh, in, in in academia that um, would help us sort of tailor some of our, um, our our modeling and our threshold calculations for fire detection. That's an excellent question, and I don't think that there are. Um, I don't think that there are any studies because it's they're really hard to do and I think we could do one because we get uh, so in all of the databases of emerge of, of of vegetation fire starts so you get they go through the computer aided dispatch and then they will go to this Irwin database this federal Irwin database um, when there is no protocol, as far as I understand, for updating the ignition location of that incident. So you, you, get, you get the call. It's where the person on the highway's car is by the time the location is set. And then we in our fusion center will refine the location of that fire. And it, that database is not updated. So if you wanted to say, understand when the fire started, the 911 call may or may not help you with that because it could have been running for 20 minutes. And then you can match it to the, to the GOES detection once we get it. But in terms of accuracy in time and space, you can't do that with most databases that exist. So there are firefighters I know that are working hard to find a way to update those databases um, and and have a mechanism for us to say this this detection has this fire incident name and it actually started at this location um, at approximately you know five minutes before you knew about it and we can do that through the monitoring of the cameras that um, that are throughout California, even still that can be hard because the camera has to be on it in order to know when it begins, but I've been able to do that through several fires. So we've been trying to document enough of that to have a reasonable data set, um, but it's really quite, it's, this, is a, this is a field that's a, a word of mouth uh, storytelling kind of field, so it's been hard to hard to build the right kind of database for that study. It's sort yeah. of a holy grail. Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah. What, what one thing, is just a quick follow-up on that, we may want to change our method of processing if we're in a sort of forensic versus a, a detection where we might wow. be interested in sort of false, false negatives to go back to find the true initiation condition versus in a detection where we may be looking for false positives. We, we want to minimize the false positives. That's super interesting. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I just wanted Thank to you. mention, since we didn't get to everybody's questions, Jessica, I might put some of them um, in a, a document. And maybe you could answer some of them offline. Absolutely. Um, I did not put, uh, I did not create a slide with my email address, but I'll just type it here. And Jessica, I put the link to our speaker page, um, which oh. does up to the Y Fire website as well um, for you and your team. And so uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, there's there's obviously a lot a lot more to discuss. Um, we are going to take the chat questions, uh, send them to you, kind of continue the dialogue via email. And uh, and just thank you to everyone. Thank you, Jessica, for um, for the presentation. And please provide us feedback on this speaker series as well as your interests in topics and speakers for the future. We do have reinsurance. We do have coffee bean growers. Uh, we do have other speakers uh, coming up and so we will be announcing those as they get uh, scheduled 
and we are always happy to take recommendations and suggestions from everyone. So um, thank you very much for sharing your lunch with us. Jessica, thank you again to you and your team, and we will be following up um, by email with everyone. Thank, so, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Um,